All right, so here in 14.5, we're going to be taking a closer look at drug resistance. So we've spent a lot of time now going over the different types of antimicrobials and how they work specifically. And it's important to understand how they work, not just so that you do understand, but also so that you can understand drug resistance. Um, we often hear superbugs and we hear that, you know, things are becoming more and more resistant. Now let's talk about how it is that this resistance is actually happening at the molecular level. Um, recall, however, at first that we spoke about um, how in nature that microorganisms are evolving to overcome antimicrobials. <clears throat> and the reason that they're evolving to overcome antimicrobials uh, is for multiple reasons. The main reason is even if humans never existed on this planet, um, but all of their life did, let's say, um, they would still be doing this. They would be producing antimicrobials because, as we mentioned, if we're even talking about just the soil, in the soil we have... Uh, many, many different types of bacteria, for example, not to mention other um, microorganisms, but bacteria, and they're competing. They're competing for resources, and so if they're competing for resources, they're going to find a way to make a chemical to kill off their competitors um, or inhibit their competitors. Maybe it would be bacteria static. And so they're going to do that, while at the same time, the other bacteria that are there are going to be doing the same thing against them. So microorganisms as a whole are constantly evolving. They're constantly developing drug resistance against each other. And then our human development of antimicrobials, so us going in, either creating our own uh, chemically or using natural, run, natural ones and amplifying them um, and then using them, this widespread use of antimicrobials has then further promoted evolution of these antimicrobials in microorganisms. Um, so not only would they be doing this naturally, making this, this drug resistance, but because we are making so much of these different types of drugs, it's, it's being put out there everywhere, then there's an increased rate of them making antimicrobial, um, or, you know, an increased rate of drug resistance to them. <clears throat> so... Um, this acceleration is due to the overuse and misuse of antimicrobials. So I think particularly we've all heard where if somebody goes into the doctor or the clinic and, and they're sick with something and the doctor may prescribe antibacterials, um, but then later on they find out that it was an antiviral or that it was a, a viral infection. An antibacterium drug, antibacterial drug, is not going to do anything for a viral infection. We know that because they work completely differently, uh, a bacteria versus a virus, we know that they function completely differently, and therefore any of our antibacterials are not going to have any effect whatsoever on our, our virus. Um, so that would be a misuse of antimicrobials. And so this person may be taking a whole bunch of antibiotics um, and is doing nothing for their illness, but what it is doing is what we've spoken about with antibiotics. It's killing off all the bacteria in their body. Um, if it's not killing off the bacteria in their body, then what it might be doing is causing resistance. So those that are able to withstand the antibiotic that's being put inside of the body are now going to have the genetic makeup to then withstand that, and then it can pass that along to others, and we'll look at that in just a moment. Um, overuse, same thing. If a person is constantly going in to get more antibacterials, um, then they're going to be developing bacteria inside their body that can then overcome that bacteria or that um, antimicrobial. Inappropriate use, so misuse or inappropriate use are similar. Um, inappropriately using bacteria or um, antimicrobials or antibacterials, um, so using the wrong one, for example, maybe a narrow spectrum when it needed to be a different type of narrow spectrum or, or a broad spectrum, things like that. Um, Subtherapeutic dosing, so if they don't get the correct dose based on their infection. Um, if they give a more sub meaning below, so a, a lower level of therapeutic dose, then that's just a kind of slow, low, constant um, providing of that pharmaceutical. And in that case, then the bacteria, since it's not enough to actually kill them, um, can then just develop a way to, re to be resistant to them. And then patient noncompliance with the recommended course of treatment. Um, this one is kind of variable. There are different ways of looking at it. Um, for a long time, it was looked at as when a particular antimicrobial is prescribed, it needs to be taken for the full course, um, and that is what needs to be done. And if it is not done, then you are contributing to drug resistance. 
Now there's some other research that's saying that's not the case and that actually what should be done is it should only be taken until the person has lessened symptoms. Um, I think I speak about it more later here. Um, but the reason for that is because then the body's immune system, natural immune system can take over. And then what happens is the uh, bacteria are going to be exposed to the antimicrobial for less time. So it may not then develop that resistance. <clears throat> so rather than the old thought, which was take all the drugs, get rid of and kill everything you possibly can to not let any little guy hanging out in there that could become resistant to be in there. Um, now the idea is that if we just take enough to get us past the dangerous part of an infection, for example, um, then the, we can allow the body to take over the rest of the way, get rid of and clear the infection without introducing more antibiotics, which would then give those bacteria more time to kind of come up with a way to resist it. All right, so... <clears throat> First of all, um, when we talk about this drug resistance, we talk about um, it being passed on. We talk about there being more and more and more bacteria that are becoming resistant, and how does this happen? So when a pathogen is exposed to a particular antimicrobial, <clears throat> what we see is that some of them will die right away. Um, they'll be completely susceptible, and they'll die right away. Some of them may be a little bit resistant. It may not affect them more for some reason. Um, maybe some small mutation in the DNA when it was um, going through binary fission. Uh, for some reason, it's a little bit more resistant. And then for some reason, some may be a lot more resistant. So as you can imagine, if we have this kind of soup of bacteria that has varying levels of resistance or susceptibility to a particular antimicrobial, uh, those that are susceptible are just gonna die away those that are resistant um, can hang out longer. Um, they're not going to be as affected by the antimicrobial. And if they do, if they hang out longer, then they can start to go through binary fission still and pass on that genetic information. So that is called vertical gene transfer. So it's transferred vertically to further generation. So it's going through binary fission. As it's doing that, it's making copies of itself that have the genetic makeup to then be resistant to a particular antimicrobial. So then it becomes predominant in a population given repeated exposure. So if we think about um, this soup, you know, the first ones that are totally resistant are, die are killed off. Those that are, uh, are totally susceptible, I think I said that wrong, totally susceptible are killed off. And then those that are left behind are resistant. And then they, you know, make copies of themselves, make copies of themselves. Then we've got a whole bunch of bacteria in this soup now that are living amongst this antimicrobial um, and have been able to withstand it. Now, if we, you know, wash away the antimicrobial because our body does get rid of it over time and introduce even more, then it, it may, it, let's say we give a higher dose, it may kill off some of those that are not quite as resistant. Um, they might not be able to hold in there just as long. So it might kill off those that are a little bit weaker in their resistance. But what it then is selecting for are those that are really strongly resistant to it. Um, and then those will divide and divide and divide. And so now in this, in this soup, we have those that are really, really resistant. And then uh, we're still infected, so let's say we give an even higher dose. If we give another dose or another higher dose, then again, those that are a little bit weaker in their resistance are going to die off, but what we're really selecting for over time is the ones that are the most resistant to this drug. Um, and then that causes a problem because now we have a whole bunch of bacteria that are all very, very resistant to a drug that are making lots of copies of themselves. So they're making lots of copies of themselves, which is going to stay in this particular population, However, they also can go through horizontal gene transfer. Um, when they go through horizontal gene transfer, that means that any other bacteria that happen to be hanging out in the area, um, maybe at this point, maybe um, we've killed off all of these things, we wash away the antimicrobial, what's left behind are these super resistant bacteria, but we start to introduce new bacteria. We're eating food, taking probiotics, let's say, and some of those bacteria get in there and what they do is they exchange genetic information. Um, so remember that we can move things between bacteria. Uh, it doesn't have to be the same type of bacteria. They can exchange information. Um, and this is done many ways. Remember horizontal gene transfer. Um, first of all, a mutation can be found on a plasmid. So that could give um, 
resistance, that mutation can give resistance, or in transposons, and then they can go through transfer. Um, so they can transfer it between different organisms. Then the transposons can move the mutation between the plasmid and the chromosome so that now when that particular bacteria goes through vertical gene transfer, it's transferring that resistance um, to every generation. So we've got this soup where we've got uh, you know, resistance to a particular antimicrobial. We add more bacteria. They're going to be transferring plasmids back and forth. So now that new bacteria that was not resistant before now has resistance because it just got it from the other bacteria. And then let's just say that's on a plasmid because that's what we move easily back and forth. But now that plasmid via these transposons can then be put into the main chromosome of that second bacteria. Once it's put in the main chromosome of that second bacteria, then it can make copies of itself. And now we have, let's say two in this case, two species of bacteria that both have resistance to this antimicrobial when the second one was never even really exposed to it. Uh, only the first one was. And so this is how we see um, this spreading all of this drug resistance um, is because we're able, the bacteria are able to transfer back and forth, and those that aren't even exposed to the particular antimicrobial can get resistance just by being around bacteria that have been exposed to it. So what do we mean by drug resistance? We say resistance, resistance. <clears throat> what does that really mean? How are they resistant? Well, there are different ways to be resistant, and we are going to take a look at four different ways that they can be resistant to these particular antimicrobials. Um, so one is with an efflux pump. Um, in this case, what we're talking about is where they are just actively pumping out the antimicrobial. So these are some examples of what is actively just pumped right out of the bacteria if they have the genetic makeup to make an efflux pump. Over here, we have blocked penetration. So if they have the DNA, the genetic makeup, um, these can be specifically blocked. So the way that these particular antimicrobials get in will just be blocked by the, the genetic information or the proteins they make, you know, the, that are passed along. <clears throat> Another is target modification. Um, so these guys here are going to be um, resisted against um, based on their target is going to be modified. Um, we're going to talk about different ways that that happens, but if they can change the target that these guys have, um, then they no longer work. So... <clears throat> And then lastly, inactivation of enzymes. Um, so these, if we have the inactivation of the enzymes, then um, these particular antimicrobials are going to be able to come in and they're not going to do anything to them anymore. So let's take a closer look at each of these so I can explain them in more detail. So the first one, drug modification or inactivation. <clears throat> so if we have resistance genes, so remember all of these um, ways that um, bacteria are going to be resistant to drugs is because somewhere in their, in their DNA, they, they have genes. And these genes are going to code for something that's going to make them resistant. So the resistance genes code for enzymes. In this case, we're coding for enzymes to modify or inactivate an antimicrobial. So what these genes are actually doing is they're saying, okay, when we see a particular antimicrobial, what that enzyme does, what it's made for, is to go over that antimicrobial chemical and to modify it by adding something to it, let's say, or inactivate it by just breaking it apart. Um, so they have actually developed whole enzymes that are just meant to resist our, um, our antibacterials or antimicrobials. And remember, they're not necessarily ours. These were made by bacteria also. So, for example, aminoglycoside resistance. Um, so in this case, there's the enzymatic transfer of chemical groups to that drug molecule. Um, and then since they actually attach these other molecules to it, then it doesn't bind to the bacterial target. So it doesn't bind to the target. It can't do its job. So it just kind of sticks stuff on there, and then it no longer works. Uh, for the beta-lactams, there is hydrolysis of the beta-lactam bond inside of that beta-lactam ring. I should say beta-lactam ring. So then it loses its antibacterial activity. So remember we spoke about beta-lactamases that the bacteria now make. Um, beta-lactamases, the enzymes that go in there, and they'll just break apart the beta-lactam. And then once it's broken apart, it's no longer used. Rifampin resistance um, is because of glycosylation, which is adding... Um, a, 
glycogen group, phosphorylation, adding a phosphate group, and then ADP ribosylation, um, which is adding an ADP ribose to it. So again, globbing something on, and now that we've stuck stuff to the rifampin, it no longer does what it's supposed to do. Macrolides and lincosamides. In this case, there's the enzymatic inactivation of the drug or modification. So they can go in and just break it and inactivate it. Um, or they can go in and stick stuff to it and modify it, change it around um, so that they no longer work. So these are some of the ways that bacteria have developed resistance to some of these antimicrobials is by modifying them or inactivating them. Uh, prevention of cellular uptake or efflux. Mm -hmm. So in this case, what we're doing is we're preventing or they are preventing the accumulation of the drug. Um, if they prevent the accumulation of the drug, so by preventing it from getting in or by forcing it out, then it never really gets to the high enough levels for it to get to its target. Um, so if there's just, you know, this is an imaginary number, but if we send out just one single chemical, if, if one single chemical antimicrobial gets into a cell, the chance of it finding its target and stopping it from doing what it's doing is very low. Um, so, of course, we don't give a very small amount. If we give a lot, um, we get a lot in there so it gets to its target. But the bacteria have made it so that either they're not uptake, uh, they're not taken up, um, or they just actively pump them out. So, for example, um, gram-negative pathogens mostly do this, um, are preventing the uptake. So, for example, carbapenem resistance in Pseudomonas aeruginosa what they have done is their way of resisting is by decreasing the amount of opera D porins in the outer membrane. So this is the portal of entry. So um, there are different types of porins in bacteria, and one of their porins is opera D porins, and that's how the carbapenems would get into the cell. And so the bacteria, as a way of resisting this, has decreased the amount of those porins and therefore decreased the amount of carbapenems that can get in and then stop the growth of the bacteria. So that's one way that they've prevented cellular uptake. The other example is the efflux pumps. We see this in both gram-negative and gram-positive. In this case, they're actively transporting it out of the cell. They're, they're seeing that it's a chemical and they're like, yep, you're out of here, we're sending you out. Um, so then again, it's preventing that accumulation to that antibacterial level. Um, we see this with our beta-lactams, our tetracyclines, our fluoroquinolones. <clears throat> so they actually are actively pumped out of the cell. And one of the um, things with the efflux pump is that the opposite of what we just talked about, let's say for the carbapenems, for example, if we decrease these opera D porins, then it may only affect the carbapenems. And then all of these other antimicrobials aren't going to be affected because we've just decreased this one particular porin, which the carbapenems use to get in. Efflux pumps, for example, um, it's very common if it has the genetic makeup, the, the genes to make an efflux pump, that that efflux pump can actually identify several antimicrobials and ship most of those or many of those out of the cell. So it's not specific to one type of antimicrobial. Another way is through target modification. So they'll make structural changes to the target of the drug. Um, and then this is going to prevent the binding of the drug. So um, <clears throat> sometimes this just happens normally. Um, spontaneously mutation um, can happen in particular genes. So this is common. And so that's why sometimes our pharmaceuticals will stop working is because um, just naturally, spontaneously, things have mutated. Um, we see this obviously with viruses, although we're not talking about viruses here, but um, with viruses, recall that there's a lot of mutations, and with a lot of mutations means that our antiviral drugs have a hard time um, you know, getting to that particular drug because they're changing so often. We see the same thing with the targets inside of our bacteria that we're trying to kill as well. Um, however, they can then actively change this. Um, so they'll change the active site, for example, of the penicillin binding proteins, remember the PBPs. And what that does is it's going to inhibit the beta-lactam. So remember the beta-lactams attached to the penicillin binding proteins. Um, and if they change the active site, then the beta-lactams will no longer be able to fit and attach to the penicillin binding proteins. 
So what they've done is they have acquired new low affinity uh, PBPs. And so what that means, low affinity means that um, there's a decrease for the, the affinity of the beta-lactams, for example. Um, so we see a resistance to methicillin and other beta-lactams. And this is where we get MRSA from, the methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, is because what they've done is rather than the methicillin being able to attach to the, the penicillin-binding proteins and then act to um, decrease the cell growth, <clears throat> um, now they have developed this modification, this change to their PBP is to where our methicillin doesn't really attach very well anymore. And since it doesn't attach very well anymore, we're not able to use methicillin. And methicillin was one of these things that we really needed um, to get rid of Staphylococcus aureus infections, which can be very dangerous. So if a person has methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, it's because they have these new low-affinity PBPs, likely, um, which is preventing the methicillin from binding and then killing off that bacteria. Uh, we also see changes in ribosome subunits. So remember the two different subunits we could attach to them. So our macrolides, tetracyclines, and amine glycosides. So if they change the way or the shape of the ribosome, then our, our antimicrobials don't work anymore. Same with our lipopolysaccharide structure. <clears throat> the RNA polymerase, if they change the shape of that enzyme. Our DNA gyrase, changing the shape of that. So all of the ways that we have found um, to target bacterial cells, they then are finding a way to make it to where they're overcoming that um, through target modification. And then also different metabolic enzymes. So <clears throat> they're able to um, change the actual enzymes that make the folic acid, for example, like we spoke about um, with the sulfa drugs and the trimethoprim. And then same thing with peptidoglycan subunit peptide chains. So they're able to actually change and modify the things that they're using so they no longer look the way that they need to look for our drugs to be able to work on them. Another way is by target overproduction um, or enzymatic bypass. So first let's talk about target overproduction. Um, so in this case, if we say we have a particular antimicrobial and it goes to a particular target, let's, go, let's say it goes to enzyme A, our antimicrobial A is going to attach to enzyme A, and it's going to stop it from working, and if it stops it from working, it kills the cell. In this case, what the microbe can do is it can overproduce that target enzyme to overcome the amount of antimicrobial we have given it. So if we use pretend numbers, let's say this bacteria, what it needs is five enzyme A's to make all the stuff it needs to make in order to reproduce. If we then give them our antimicrobial A, antibacterial A, then our antibacterial A, we give in a high enough dose to where it will attach to all of these enzyme A's and stop it and then kill the cell. What the microbe, if it has developed resistance to this make-believe antibacterial A or antimicrobial A, what it can do is it can make, say, instead of the five copies it needs, if it makes 15 copies of enzyme A, and then we give our dose of antimicrobial A, our antimicrobial A is going to go in and block a whole bunch of these enzyme A's, but the bacteria will still have enough enzyme A's to go through what it needs to, to make the products it needs to make, and then go through division. So we could be giving this antibiotic, but it's seemingly making no difference, and it's not because they're resistant, and they're resistant because they're overproducing an enzyme that they need. <clears throat> They can also then develop a new pathway that bypasses the use of that enzyme altogether. So if we use the same example of enzyme A, if it was making enzyme A, and now we have an antibacteria A that's able to attach to that and stop it from working, instead the bacteria says, okay, well, that's not working anymore. I'm just going to go ahead and make enzyme B. Now enzyme B is going to be making the same thing that enzyme A used to make. So if we give that particular antibiotic A then, sure, it's going to go in and it's going to attach to all of the enzyme A's and stop them from working. However, if this particular bacteria is resistant, it now can make enzyme B. And now that it can make enzyme B, it can still happily go on its way making what it needs to and then copying itself. 
So we see both of these in sulfonamide resistance, so sulfa drugs. For example, this is why we have vancomycin resistance and Staphylococcus aureus. Um, <clears throat> so what we see here is that there's a decrease in cross linkages in the outer cell wall of the bacteria. What this does is it increases the targets. Um, so in this case, this is the overproduction of the target. So if there are not cross linkages in the cell wall or if they're less cross linking, then um, there are little, I kind of think of them as little sticky pieces hanging out because there's no cross links. And so these little sticky, sticky pieces end up being targets for vancomycin. So they attach to those peptide chains that are not cross-linked, and then what happens is they clump up in the cell wall. Because they clump up in the cell wall, though, what they end up doing is creating blockages. So rather than there being holes or pores where the vancomycin can actually then get inside of the cell and block cell wall synthesis... Um, it's actually created a blockage to where it now can't get inside the cell in order to stop the production of cell wall synthesis or, or the production of the cell wall. Um, and so it's being blocked from getting in the cell by itself. Uh, so that's a serious problem uh, for us, <clears throat> a good thing for those bacteria because they've developed a way to be resistant to vancomycin. Um, but then, of course, that's a big deal, vancomycin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, because then we have to try to get a different approach. Uh, the next way that they are resistant is through target mimicry. In this case, the microbe is going to produce a protein that mimic, mimics targets of the antimicrobials. Um, so with our make-believe example of enzyme A and our antimicrobial A, if we think of it in a different way, what the microorganism may do is it can produce proteins that look like enzyme A. So if it still just makes five copies of enzyme A to do what it needs to do, what it can do then is it can make, say, 10 or 15 copies of an enzyme or 10 or 15 copies of a molecule that looks like and has the same binding site as enzyme A. And then when we give our antimicrobial A, it'll go in and it'll attach to all these binding sites, but it'll be a fake enzyme A. So it can then still use its enzyme A to go along and make copies of itself. <clears throat> um, in this case, what it's doing then, it's binding those drugs with its, its mimicked target, its fake target, and then it sequesters them. Sequesters meaning they're attached now, and then it can just shoo them to the side and then break them down and get rid of them. So we see this with mycobacterium tuberculosis. It produces a protein with a pentapeptide, or uh, a pentaprotein repeat. Um, penta meaning five, so it's a five protein repeat. And what this does is it looks like DNA. And since it looks like DNA, mm -hmm. then our antimicrobial, fluoroquinolone, is thinking that it's blocking DNA. You know, it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's attaching but now it's bound to this fake pentaprotein and it's sequestered. It's moved off to the side while um, mycobacterium tuberculosis keeps going on making DNA. Some others, uh, aminoglycoside resistance uh, by proteins that mimic the A site of the bacterial ribosome. So remember, um, that's one that's going to affect the large or the ribosome. And so then we can have <coughs> this fake mimic a site um, that the aminoglycoside can attach to. So this is our summary again of the things that we just went over. We talked about blocking, getting these in. You should know the, the ones that are being blocked. Um, target modification and knowing these, inactivation of the enzymes and knowing those, and then the efflux pump and knowing those. All right, so let's take a look now at this multi-drug resistant microbes. And we've kind of already talked about this, how um, they can carry one or more resistant mechanisms. Um, these are what are called superbugs. So when something is resistant to a particular antimicrobial, um, then they're just, you know, that antimicrobial resistant. Um, if they have multi-drug resistant, or excuse me, resistance, then that's when they're called superbugs um, because there are many things that, cannot kill them. Um, what we see here is we have cross-resistance. 
So we have single resistance, a single resistance mechanism like the efflux pump, for example, confers resistance to multiple antimicrobial drugs. So remember that our efflux pump can export several of them, pump them out. Um, so when that one is transferred to a new bacteria, it can immediately become a multi-drug resistant microbe or a superbug because that can pump out many types of antimicrobials. Uh, this is responsible for more than 2 million infections a year in the United States, at least 23,000 deaths. Um, <clears throat> some of these are what are called the escape pathogens. So these are pathogens that you can remember escape, quote, escape conventional forms of antimicrobial therapy. Uh, most of these are nosocomial infections, so those that you can get in the hospital. So you should know the escape pathogens. So you can see the E for Enterococcus phacum, Fistium. Uh, Staph aureus, K, A, P, and E. So you should know these different escape pathogens. These are pathogens that are multi-drug resistant microbes. They're also called superbugs um, because they are able to escape all of these normal um, antimicrobial therapy methods or therapies. So let's take a closer look at MRSA, um, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, M-R-S-A. <coughs> So recall that methicillin is designed to resist inactivation by beta-lactamases. Mm -hmm. So remember that we have other penicillins, which are beta-lactamases, and those have been used on different bacteria, and then bacteria are able to inactivate the beta-lactams. Um, that is done by beta-lactamases, but then we came up with methicillin. Methicillin was a for lack of a better word right now, a stronger version of the penicillins uh, or beta-lactamases, um, or beta-lactams, sorry, a stronger version of the beta-lactams. And so we were using that to get rid of these really strong Staph aureus um, infections. But then, so we designed it to resist the inactivation by the beta-lactamases. However, then they developed a new mechanism, uh, these particular Staphylococcus aureus strains, where they have these new low affinity PBPs. So remember, they don't attach as easily. So they're resistant to all beta-lactams now. <clears throat> um, so now all of the other penicillins, and including methicillin, which was kind of our last line of defense at the time, or recently, um, are now not able to be used on Staphylococcus aureus. This is a widespread opportunistic pathogen. So remember, an opportunistic pathogen is one that um, is taking the opportunity when the person's down to uh, cause infection, so meaning that they're typically infected with something else. We see this with skin, other wound infections, with pneumonia, septicemia. <clears throat> it was originally a problem in healthcare settings, so it was just called HA MRSA, which is hospital-acquired MRSA. But now it can be acquired through contact with any contaminated person in the public, which is community-acquired or community-associated MRSA. Um, just as a note, one-third of the population carries Staph aureus as just part of their normal nasal microbiota, um, just meaning that that's just part of their healthy natural biome. Um, <clears throat> and 6% of these are methicillin-resistant. Um, so... If we have a third of the population having Staph aureus in their bodies and 6% of them have a methicillin-resistant version, if that particular person sneezes by somebody that doesn't naturally have Staph aureus in their biome and then they are getting a methicillin-resistant version, that could cause a serious problem. And that's where we get the community-associated MRSA. Um, so, of course, this is where good hygiene and things like that come in to play because this is something that the person isn't sick, right? So this is a person that's just out there, not sick at all because it's part of their natural body. Um, and then say they happen to sneeze or cough or something just because they get something stuck in their throat, for example. Um, if they do that, then they could get that on a person and that could cause a serious infection in the other person. Uh, the other or another one is the VRE, is the vancomycin-resistant enterococci. Mm -hmm. um, so we did talk about vancomycin resistance already. Um, we also have vancomycin-resistant staph aureus, which is Versa, and vancomycin-intermediate staph aureus, which is Visa. So remember that vancomycin is used to treat wound infections. 
um, septic infections, endocarditis, and meningitis that are caused by pathogens that are resistant to other antibiotics, so gram-positive organisms. Um, this was our, you know, after we had methicillin uh, for Staph aureus infections, which was kind of our last line of defense, then we came up with vancomycin. And vancomycin is now our very last line of defense against MRSA. Um, and so then when we are trying to fight against MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, then we're coming up with vancomycin-resistant Staph aureus. So um, yet again, another problem. Um, <clears throat> When we have vancomycin-resistant enterococci, which is the VRE, um, we see that they have that they use target modification. So they change the structure of the peptide in the peptidoglycan subunits, and that prevents bonding of the vancomycin. And then this is often spread among patients by healthcare workers um, through contaminated surfaces, and then also through medical equipment. So another example of typically a nosocomial infection, meaning one that's acquired in the hospital. For Visa, the intermediate resistance, vancomycin, the intermediate um, Staphylococcus aureus, we have a minimum inhibitory concentration, or an MIC, of 4 to 8 micrograms per milliliter. Um, so what this means is there's some sort of intermediate resistance, you know, as the name implies, where there is some resistance to it, doesn't kill it off right away. This is why I was mentioning earlier this kind of soup of bacteria. Some of them are susceptible, so they'll just die right away. Um, some of them are, say, intermediate resistance, where they're, they don't get killed off right away. Um, in this case, this is an example where we have this decreasing of the cross linkages in the cell wall, and then that increases the targets, and then it creates the blockages that we spoke about. <laughs> In Versa, which is fully resistant, vancomycin resistant Staph aureus, um, this resistance is via horizontal gene transfer from VRE, from the enterococci. So uh, this is typically seen when a patient is co-infected with the vancomycin resistant enterococci, and then they have the vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus as well. So in this case, there's a higher level of resistance, so the MIC or the minimum inhibitory concentration is 16 micrograms per milliliter or higher. Um, so it would need a whole lot of vancomycin to try to kill it, um, but then even at these really, really high levels, we see resistance. Um, so in this case, we need rapid identification to start procedures to try to limit the spread because we certainly don't want this out there because this is our last line of defense. Vancomycin is our strongest thing we've got here, um, and, it, and these are becoming resistant. Um, so what we have developed are some new treatments for these, um, and some new treatments for MRSA. Um, so our oxozolidinones, um, are what we have now. So our new last line of defense are these new treatments for, uh, Versa and MRSA. <clears throat> We also have extended spectrum beta lactamases. Um, so these are produced by some gram negative pathogens. So again, the beta lactamases. So they're showing resistance to all penicillins, some also cephalosporins, monobactams, beta lactamase inhibitor combinations. Um, so they're not resistant to carbapenems, however. So the genes that are encoding for these ESBLs are on mobile plasmids. So they're able to move from one to another very, very easily. <clears throat> and these mobile plasmids, a lot of them are the ones that contain these ESBLs, also contain resistance for other drug classes. Um, so this would be moved very easily, and then that would create one of these superbugs. So for example, fluoroquinolones, the aminoglycosides, or the tetracyclines. Um, so spread via horizontal gene transfer. <clears throat> So again, similar to the situation with Staph aureus, where about a third of our population has Staph aureus in them already, um, these may be normal microbiota for some people, but then they end up being opportunistic um, infections for hospitalized in patients. So again, another nosocomial opp opportunistic infection um, to where the person's in there for something else, and then someone, say, coughs or sneezes or something, and then they pass along something that's just normal in their own body, but to another person can end up becoming a very serious infection. Uh, next, we have our carbapenem-resistant gram-negative bacteria. 
Um, so that some examples are the carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, so CRE, and some others here. They develop resistance through different mechanisms. So one is a production of carbapenemases, so enzymes that are going to inactivate. Um, these happen to be broad-spectrum beta-lactamases, though, so they're going to inactivate all of the beta-lactamases and carbapenemase and carbapenems. Um, also, efflux of the carbapenems out of the cell, so an efflux pump, and then prevention of carbapenem entry through the porin channel. So again, decreasing those porins so that they're not able to get in. These are usually resistant to multiple classes, so just like those ESBLs, we see them lump together on the plasmids and they move around. Some have developed pan resistance, which means resistance to all available antibacterials. Um, so every antibacterial that we can think of and that we're making, some of these have developed pan resistance, pan meaning all of them. They commonly occur in healthcare settings, um, in contaminated individuals and in medical devices or through surgery. So again, in hospital settings, we're just passing these things from one person to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, even if they're not in there for one thing, they get another thing and, and just completely, you know, transferring these things around, they can end up having multiple drug resistance genes on um, a plasmid, and then once we have these multiple gene, re multiple drug resistance genes on these plasmids, they can just be transferred all over the place. We also have, lastly, our <clears throat> multi-drug resistant M. tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is the MDR-TB. Uh, this is resistant to rifampin and isoniazid. Uh, usually prescribed in TB cases, so that's a problem because uh, it's multi-drug resistant now, and extensively drug resistant to M. tuberculosis, which is XDR-TB. So this is also resistant to fluoroquinolone and at least one of these three other drugs. So these are usually the second line of treatment, um, and so if we give one of these, usually it's rifampin or isoniazid, and if it doesn't work because it happens to be a multi-drug resistant uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, then we would give like fluoroquinolone and one of these other three. And we have found that then there's extensively drug resistant, resistant mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, and that can be a problem because that doesn't give us many options. So then we would, uh, we would typically um, try to use one of these others at the time. Uh, so both of these infections are of great concern for immunocompromised, um, including HIV patients, because, again, we don't have many options once these things are developing pan resistance. Um, so, again, development of resistant often, resistance often is a result of incorrect use of antimicrobials for tuberculosis treatment. So um, if we are using antimicrobials that cannot be used for tuberculosis, because uh, remember it's a mycobacterium, which, mean it, which means it has that mycolic acid on its, around its cell wall, um, that gives it another layer of protection. It's very waxy, gives another layer of protection. If somebody has tuberculosis and they're given other types of bacteria or antimicrobials, antibacterials, um, that's an incorrect use. And so then it's going to start to develop this resistance in the mycobacterium because they can start to grab onto DNA um, to get resistance even if they're not being killed off by a particular bacterium, antibacterial.